Okay, so welcome back to the Motivic Geometry Seminar. So today I'm pleased to introduce Mattia Talpo, who will talk about the Kummer et al. additive invariance of log schemes. Please. Okay, um, well, let me start by thanking Paul Aronen for the invitation to give the, this talk in this series. Uh, I would have much better liked to, to actually come to Oslo for a visit, but uh, we all know why that's not possible these days. And I guess every talk by now starts with some remark like this. So, but it is, I mean, I, I do mean it. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so I wanna tell you something about this uh, Kummertal additive invariance of logarithmic schemes, which uh, we, we studied in, uh, we proved something about, in a work with, uh, in collaboration with Nicolò Sibilla and Sarah, Sarah Shirotke. Um, in passing, in, in when, uh, while, while getting to this result, I will also mention some work that we, we two did with, we three, I guess, did with David Carcetti, uh, which is related, but not, uh, not to the point. And, and some work that I did with Angelo Vistoli uh, back in, during the year of my PhD, uh, so, uh, some time ago now. And uh, so, here's a very rough plan of, uh, of the talk. I'll, I'll start by saying something about logarithmic geometry, some uh, basics. Then I'll, I'll move on to describing root stacks of, of logarithmic schemes, which are one of the main tools of, uh, of what we do. And then towards the end, I'll get to tell you a bit about this Kummer et al or Kummer flat, actually, uh, additive invariance or non-commutative motives of, uh, of logarithmic schemes. So about the introduction, every time I give a talk that's heavy on log geometry, which is most of the time, I guess, there's always the question of how, how many, you know, how, much, how much time I wanna spend on, uh, on basics. And because, um, you know, log geometry is not in the standard uh, syllabus of, of algebraic geometry yet. And, uh, and this is a motivic geometry seminar. So I can't expect everybody to already know about log geometry. So typically, sometimes I end up uh, swiping everything under the rug and, uh, and getting away with it. But um, this time I'm trying to strike a balance. So I'll spend some time on uh, on preliminaries and basics um, and then uh, so we'll, we'll see we'll see how that goes i won't be i'll try not to be too technical still so what's logarithmic geometry um it's it first of all it was developed by at the beginning by kazuya kato in the late 80s early 90s uh, based on some ideas of fontani luzi I should also mention the lean and faultings that did some work uh, that was related with a somewhat different notion that is uh, still connected to the one that I'll uh, talk about. And, and then, uh, I mean, it, it grew up, uh, became more uh, of interest to, to more people. Uh, initially, the initial applications were in piadi Codes theory, but then uh, it found applications also in moduli theory, in mirror symmetry, in, uh, a bunch of other areas. So it's log geometry is a, a version of algebraic geometry for logarithmic schemes, which are schemes with some additional structure called a logarithmic structure. If you, if you think about schemes, for example, as a scheme plus some other derived structure, that's the same thing here. Uh, so there's a scheme plus some, some other structure. And okay, let me just, uh, let me say from, from just uh, right away that here I write scheme, but you can talk about logarithmic stacks and you could also talk about log logarithmic derived schemes if you wanted to, but uh, so I'll stick with schemes for, for this introduction. There will be some stack, stacks later on. Um, so before giving you the definition, I will focus on, uh, on the prime examples of, of these objects which are pairs given by a scheme and a divisor. So the, the simplest case is when you have a, a smooth scheme or stack or whatever, and you have a smooth divisor inside it, it this pair uh, gives, 
so given this pair, there's a canonical logarithmic structure on X that I'll describe, which um, remembers the boundary D in some sense. So the, the pair will give a logarithmic scheme whose underlying scheme is X. Same thing when D is a, a simple normal processing divisor. And more generally, uh, whenever you have a toroidal embedding, which is an embedding of a divisor D, that is, it's all locally isomorphic to the embedding of, a, of the toric boundary in a normal toric variety. This also gives a logarithmic structure on, on X that uh, kind of remembers the, the, the boundary D. And here X could be singular. Uh, since toric varieties, normal toric varieties are typically singular, let's say. They're smooth ones, but... Um, and so every such pair will give a logarithmic scheme with underlying scheme X. And the way you should think about this is that this is, the, the log scheme is the scheme X, which punctured along the boundary, but not in a physical way. You're not taking X minus D. You're, uh, you're keeping, you're working on X, but marking the boundary in some sense. So remembering that the boundary is something you want to think of as a boundary. Uh, a typical, an example of, in, uh, of, of how these things come about is if you're working, if you're over a field of characteristic zero, say, and you're working with a non-compact scheme, you might want to compactify it. And if you have a resolution of singularities, so in characteristic zero, you can also make the boundary nice then you have a pair and working with the log scheme, it's like you're working on the compact space, but remembering that you really care about the complement of, of the divisor that you've added. So the official definition is the following. Uh, a logarithmic structure is on a scheme X is a pair given by a sheaf of monoids M, so commutative semi-groups with a neutral element. Uh, if you prefer. I should have written commutative here. I'm not going to add it on the, on the etal site, on the small etal site of X. So here, um, if X is a stack, you might want to use the list etal site, for example, if, you, if it's an algebraic stack, which is not really more for, for schemes, the etal topology is, is fine. And the other piece of data is a, a homomorphism of monoids from, from this uh, sheaf M, which is an extra structure sheet, basically, right? Uh, a homomorphism into the regular functions, the sheaf of regular functions, but where the operation is multiplication. So th there's a, a technical condition here that it's, it's not going to matter at all, basically, in, in what follows, that says that alpha uh, s identifies the units in M with the units in, in OX star. So in, in M, there's always a copy of OX star, which makes up exactly the units of this monoid M. So the, the elements that have a, an additive inverse, if you think about the operation in M additively. But in the cases that I, there were on the previous slide, if you have a divisor in X, the, the sheaf M that gives you the corresponding log structure is a subsheaf of the structure sheaf. So alpha is the inclusion. And it contains the, the regular functions that are invertible outside of D. So they only possibly vanish along D. For example, local equations of D are all, all inside here. And they are the relevant functions that are in here in the sense that everything else is a unit, uh, every other regular function that doesn't vanish even on D is, is a unit, of course. So this is how a uh, divisor gives you a logarithmic structure. If, uh, if D is empty up here, that means you're looking at units. And uh, in fact, every scheme has a trivial log structure where uh, the sheaf M is OX star and alpha is just the inclusion. So every scheme is a log scheme in a trivial way. Uh, and, uh, but the, the category of log schemes is, uh, is bigger. There's, um, you might think here, if you've never seen these things, that there's another trivial log structure where you take M to be the whole OX and alpha the identity. It turns out that that one is not, is less, less useful than, uh, than this one. 
this is the the initial log structure that's the final one so anyway this is this is the trivial one where where you only have the units so how how should you uh, visualize these these things these log schemes well every every log scheme has a locus where the log structure is trivial this x triv which is you could call it the open part of the of the log scheme the complement of the boundary, quote unquote. And it's the locus where the stocks of the sheaf M are exactly, O, o star, are exactly the units. And there's nothing else. Uh, so it's a locus where the log structure is trivial. Uh, there's a, usually one talks about the sheaf M bar also, which is the, the quotient of M by this copy of O star that's inside it. Uh, this M bar, is the non-trivial part of the log structure in some sense of, of the sheaf at least and uh, in, uh, in, a, in the log schemes that one uses typically that have some uh, technical conditions that i'll mention later this is this has a sort of a combinatorial or discrete nature so to speak so that's for example uh, the the trivial part of the log scheme given by a pair like the ones i mentioned before is just the complement of the divisor d that's pretty clear from the description that i had in the previous slide and the stocks the stocks of the sheaf and bar are uh, as depicted here so if you're outside of the divisor the m is all units so there's nothing if you're on a branch if you're in points that are on a single branch of the divisor, you have a copy of the natural numbers. And uh, if you are in the intersection of two components, you have an n squared. So these talks are free uh, if these simple normal crossings are free monoids and the rank records the number of branches that you're passing through, basically, that pass through that point that you're looking at. So, okay, this is pretty. Um, and, uh, now, okay, th these are the best, the, the most natural, let's say, examples of log schemes where you have a big open part and then you have the boundary. But sometimes this x trade might, might be empty. In fact, if you fix a point here, you can imagine pulling back. So log structures can be pulled back. I'm not telling you exactly how, but the, the, you can imagine you're, you're pulling back the sheaf and the morphism. And, uh, so if you pull back the log structure from the ambient space to a point here, you get uh, a log structure where this sheaf and bar, a log structure on a point where this sheaf and bar is a copy of the natural numbers. And you can write down the, the map from the sheaf. This is the sheaf M in this, in this setup to the structure sheaf, which is just K. This map sends anything that is non-zero in this coordinate to zero. Because here, the generator of this N corresponds to a local equation of D. And if you restrict to this point, which is inside of D, that local equation becomes zero. So uh, everything, everything with a positive uh, component here is going to zero. This is usually called a standard log point, or it's, uh, sometimes it's called a punctured point because in this space, it's, it's all boundary, right? It's one point and it's all boundary because there's some logarithmic structure there. So it's like you're puncturing the point. Um, so this is an example where the locus of triviality, let's say, is, is known, is empty. And you can actually, on any scheme, uh, you can imagine if there's a scheme over this point, you can pull back this log structure and get a sort of constant log structure where all the stocks are, are given by a copy of the natural numbers. And uh, in that case, also, the, it, everything is boundary. There's no, there's no open part. So these are some slightly weirder examples that if you just talk about pairs, you don't, you don't see, like it doesn't make sense to take a pair where the boundary is the whole space. So there's some more flexibility in this, in this theory. Uh, here's another picture that uh, I think is worth uh, staring, about for, staring at for a bit. So if you, if you have a semi-stable degeneration to, to A1, so, this is a flat proper morphism uh, where the generic fiber, the fibers over uh, outside of zero are, are smooth. And then the fiber over zero is uh, an SNC divisor in the total space. So it might be singular. And uh, 
you you get a map of a map of pairs where the boundary in the total space is the central fiber and the boundary downstairs is is zero. This is a morphism of log schemes. I haven't told you what morphisms of log schemes are, but even there you could imagine there's a morphism of sheaves between the the ends that is compatible with the alphas. Um, and what's, I mean, how, how, sh how should you think of this morphism between these two logarithmic schemes? So in, in the open part, there's nothing interesting because the stocks of the sheaf and bar are, are zero on both sides. The interesting stuff happens at the central fiber. In the central fiber, the, the log structure upstairs has stocks uh, N along the single irreducible components. So outside of the double intersections, say. And, and this, there's a homomorphism of monoids from the stock downstairs to the stock upstairs. And this is an isomorphism where on points uh, in this open part of each component. It's, it's interesting where at least two of the components meet because you have a non-trivial homomorphism from n to n squared. And what this is recording is some information about how the smooth fibers, the smooth generic fiber is degenerating into the, to the singular one. So if you restrict this map to, to zero, to, to the origin downstairs, you get uh, the central fiber equipped with the in induced logarithmic structure that I haven't put in the notation, is a log scheme with a map to this standard logarithmic point. And you should think about it as the central fiber of this degeneration, which is keeping track of some sort of, uh, of data attached to this moving. In fact, quite a bit about the genetic fiber can be recovered from the central fiber equipped with the, with the induced log structure in, in this sense. The, in some sense, the topology of the genetic fiber uh, is, uh, can, can be read off from this. But that's subject for another talk. So I just wanted to to uh, to show you this to build some intuition. I want to go in in a different direction now. So I haven't told you how, but there's a category of logarithmic schemes over a base log scheme, even. So you can define morphisms and uh, and all that. And typically, people restrict to um, a sub subcategory of objects that have uh, where the sheaf M and the map alpha has shards. So there's some coherence or, and finiteness condition on, on this monoid and, uh, and that map. Basically, I'm not being too precise here as well, but you, you ask that locally on X, et al. locally on X, there's a map to an affine toric variety and here K, K is a base field. Um, uh, for simplicity, um, I'm always, you can do these things over Z, over any base ring that you want, but for simplicity, let me stick with the case that we're over a field. Um, so this is an affine toric variety where P is a finitely generated monoid. And uh, let's say it's P is also saturated, so this is normal. Uh, you asked that there are maps like this such that the, the log structure of X is pulled back from the canonical log structure on this toric variety, which is basically given by the monoid P. So M, M is given by P appropriately sheafified in, uh, in some sense in these local models. So these, these are called charts. These, these local maps are called charts for the logarithmic structure. So here's an example. If, if you have an irreducible, let's say, smooth divisor in, in a variety X, then locally your, your divisor is going to be given by a single uh, equation. And you can take the corresponding morphism to A1, which is spec of the algebra associated to the natural numbers. And that's a chart for, for the logarithmic structure um, up here. So this, the log structure here is the one that has boundary the zero. and your, if you pull back that log structure along F, the boundary becomes the pre-image of zero, which is exactly D. So that's a simple example. And log structures that satisfy these uh, properties that I just told you are called fine and saturated. And uh, there's this FS uh, that's pretty prevalent in, uh, in, in this theory. 
I have to say, I want to say that uh, non-coherent log structures exist and they are interesting. They, they show up in nature, for example, in, in mirror symmetry. But uh, I will only talk about fine and saturated log schemes in the, for the rest of the talk. So one thing that you can do, you can, uh, maybe I haven't said this yet, but you can do a lot of the usual algebraic geometry uh, on, on these new objects, adapting the notions. And one thing that you can, something you can do is define a sheaf of Keller differentials in this theory. So there's a sheaf on X of logarithmic differentials. Uh, it's denoted by omega one log usually. So as, as usual, you take the differentials of all regular functions, but then you also have some extra elements given by, by the sheaf M. They're denoted by D log M because you, you impose that they satisfy this property that uh, they're, if you divide through by this element, thinking that, you know, assuming you can do that, this D log M is, is D alpha M over alpha M. So alpha M is a regular function on X that corresponds to this section M, little m. And this D log M is, is actually D log of alpha M, really. That's the, the idea. And if your log scheme is given by a SNC divisor in a smooth variety, then you get the usual sheaf of, of logarithmic differentials. So uh, you have these elements of the form dg over g, where g is a local equation for some branch, some uh, component of the, of the boundary. And with these differentials, you can imagine that there's also a notion of logarithmic smoothness and non-ramifiedness and the tallness that um, you define via the usual lifting criterion with square zero extensions as in usual algebraic geometry. And this notion of log etalness, uh, as in the case of schemes, gives you access to the topology of, uh, of a logarithmic scheme in the sense of the profinite uh, topology, let's say. So you can imagine you can imagine that you could define a fundamental group, a homotopy type, and uh, and other things. But the, this logarithmic etal topology, as it is, has uh, a small problem, for some purposes, not not for all of them, that it's somewhat too big. For example, uh, logarithmic blowups, which are blowups that that uh, are, are, bit, are morphisms between logarithmic schemes uh, that are connected to usual blocks, are all logarithmically et al in this, so are et al in this theory. For example, the, the blow up of A2 in the origin over A2 is, is an et al, morph, is a logarithmic et al morphism, which is interesting, but it's a bit too drastic, right? If you, like this changes the space by adding a whole, P1. So even here, I have to say that the considering the whole et al, log et al topology is, is also interesting. And th there's an object that you can form by considering all logarithmic blowups, let's say of A2, and taking a, a limit. It's called the valuativization of a logarithmic scheme, which is also interesting to study, but is not the direction in which I want to go today. So if you add finiteness, so to, to exclude things like this, you uh, get to what's, what are called the uh, Kummer log et al morphisms. I'll, I'll omit the, the log from now on. So Kummer is the additional condition that I'm adding to the to log et al morphisms, but I'm omitting the log from the, no, for the name, from the name. So just for brevity. So Kummer et al morphisms are, generated in some sense. So it can be obtained by locally, let's say you're going locally, it can be obtained by composing classical et al morphisms, by which I mean morphisms of log schemes that are et al at the level of underlying schemes and for which the log structure doesn't change from the source to the target. So the log structure of the source is just pulled back from the target. So there's nothing logarithmic going on. These are just classical tarmorphisms uh, transported into this, this logarithmic world. 
the, the non-trivial bit is that you also have base changes of maps of, of the following kind, where you have an affine toric variety given by monoid P, and you take multiplication by some integer from P to P uh, with the integer co-prime to the characteristic of the base field. So if this is, if this is a chart of some X that you're looking at, uh, you take the base change that I'm not going to draw because it would end up here. And the, the horizontal arrow here is a Kummer-Tal cover, Kummer-Tal morphism. So let me give you a couple of examples to uh, just to see what this means. For example, the, the nth power map from the log scheme given by the pair A1, 0 to itself is Kummer-Tal. It's exactly of the form. Uh, so P here is n, the natural numbers. And uh, multiplication by n has this effect uh, at the level of the morphism of schemes. So this is a tau over the complement of the boundary, and it's tamely ramified along the boundary. That's the, the general gist of this, of this kind of morphisms. So another example is in, in A2, where you have the two axes as boundary. You can do a similar thing where the exponents don't need to be the same. This is also a, a kummer tal map. And in general, if you have some nice pairs, so let's say with S and C, with X and Y smooth and D and E are S and C. If you have a map between them, that's a tal over the complement of the boundary downstairs and tamely ramified over, over the boundary, then this is a kummer tal map. So you're allowing ramification along the boundary where the log scheme is concentrated. Here, I'm not giving you any example where the log structure is non-generically uh, tri trivial. So it's generically non-trivial. Uh, but those are, yeah, those are a bit more weird. This should look pretty natural. But so once you've decided to work with this Kumertal topology, uh, you get a site and a topos, Kumertal topos, and you can think about the Kummer-Tal geometry of a, of a logarithmic scheme. So, in fact, there's a theory of the algebraic fundamental group, the Kummer-Tal fundamental group. There's an etal homotopy type and uh, other things. And then you can also think about coherent sheaves and perfect complexes and algebraic K-theory, which is where I want to get with, uh, with all this story. So the, the first person to, to my knowledge to, to consider this was Hagihara in uh, 2003 or, or something. And he and Nizio later, which uh, improved upon, let me erase this, improved upon his work. Um, so generalized it a bit. Uh, Matthias, sorry, yep, yep. before you continue this, there's a question for you in the, in the chat from, Am from Amalendo. Yeah, yeah. So it's a log et al map, which is fine at Kummer et al. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I can prove it right now, but uh, I think the answer is yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I mean, sorry, there's this ramification um, issue. No, I mean, here I, I've, I've asked that N, N be co-prime with the characteristic so, yeah, you have to be careful about that. That's the only, the only thing. Yeah, I, I can actually, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try to pay more attention. To that. I think I can see. So I was saying, um, Hagiar and Nizio consider the algebraic K theory of this Kummertal site and they prove the following theorem which is what me Nicola and Sarah then uh, generalized to the categorical level to some categorical level so their their theorem is says the following uh, for for pairs where x is smooth and d is an snc divisor uh, they, they gave a description a decomposition of the kummer tal k theory of this logarithmic scheme given by the pair in the following way so with, with, with DJ, so I is the, the set of irreducible components of D. 
And when J is a subset of I, you can take the intersection of all the, the, of the corresponding components. Their theorem is a decomposition of the K theory of the logarithmic, you know, kummer K theory of this as uh, the K theory of the space X of the scheme of the underlying scheme. Plus, and then, and then there's a big sum with pieces given by the K theory of these intersections so of the strata of the stratification. And there's a bunch of copies of each one of these. Uh, the copies are indexed by this free abelian group lambda. That is the following thing. Let's look at the version. There's a prime here, which is a co-prime to p condition. But let's let's look at the, this thing without the prime first. This is the free abelian group generated by this set q mod z minus zero and the product of this guy. Uh, uh, product of a number of copies of this guy indexed by this J, which are the components of D that I'm looking at in this stratum. So there's one copy of this K theory for each element of this set here. In the, in the version with the prime, you take Q mod Z prime. So you uh, don't allow denominators that are divisible by P. Basically, you take the localization of Z at the prime P and take the quotient of that by, by Z. It's not the P-addicts. Um, so, okay, this is the decomposition for the Kummer et al. K theory. Uh, I haven't mentioned these Kummer flat maps yet, but I'm doing that now. So, uh, Nizio later on uh, gave a decomposition for the Kummer flat K theory as well. So, Kummer flat maps are defined similarly to Kummer et al maps, but they also allow um, ramification that is not co-prime to the characteristic of the base field. So taking p pth roots in uh, pth powers in characteristic p is fine. That's a Kummer flat map. The decomposition is exactly the same, apart that from the fact that from in here you don't have to exclude uh, denominators that have p as a factor. So this is the result. Yeah, this, I don't know, it might seem a bit mysterious, like where, where are these things coming? Or maybe it isn't, I don't know. But uh, hopefully in what I'll show you next, it will become a bit clearer what, what these uh, elements of Q mod Z minus zero are, uh, are signifying. They're, they're gonna correspond to characters of the stabilizer group of, of some, stack uh, associated to, to this pair. This, sorry, transfer for London. The, um, this, uh, these stabilizers are, are, are gonna live on the boundary of uh, live over D basically. And um, yeah, so hopefully it will become a bit clearer where these, these things show up geometrically, let's say. So we, um, what, what I'm going to present now, start working towards, is a categorification of these decompositions. So there will be a similar formula for what we call the non-commutative, the Kummer flat or Kummer et al. non-commutative motive of a logarithmic scheme. And uh, that will come from semi-orthogonal decompositions on uh, the category of perfect complexes on something. So that's what I'm uh, gonna head towards next. That something is, uh, is gonna be a, a root stack. So these things were um, introduced and um, studied first by Kadman and uh, at the same time by Abramovich, Graeber and Vistoli. And then later on, they, uh, the general notion that I'm referring to uh, of a root stack of a, any of a, an arbitrary log scheme was uh, defined by Born and Vistoli. So here, I'm, I'm not gonna give you the general definition, but to any log scheme and natural number, you can associate uh, an algebraic stack, the nth root of x depicted, you know, written like this, um, which is, uh, it's, it's a Tay Martin stack in general. It's the Lim Mumford if uh, n is co-prime with the residue of, uh, with the characteristic of your, of your field, of your base field. 
and it's um, so it's a stack over X. It has a map to X, a map to X, which is a coarse moduli space morphism, and uh, it's a, it's also an isomorphism over the locus where the log structure of X is trivial. So over there, this this thing is just X itself. This stack has, on the other hand, non-trivial stabilizers over the locus where the log structure lives, so the complement of the triviality locus. And this map, this map is ramified over there as well. So this is a sort of ramified morphism of degree one, in some sense. That's one way to think about it. Or if, uh, if this locus of triviality is dense in here, say x is irreducible, for example, this is also a proper birational morphism of, of stacks. So you could also think about it as some sort of blow up. And you could call it a stacky blow up. I mean, there's a notion of stacky blow up and, and this is one of them. Um, where you're blowing up along a divisor. That's, of course, you can't do that with usual blow ups. I mean, you won't get anything non-trivial. In fact, X is smooth, say X is smooth. So I'm not going to give you the general definition, but for example, if, if you have a smooth variety with a, a divisor given by a single equation, so a principal divisor, then you can construct this as a quotient of uh, the relative spectrum of this sheaf of algebras over X, where you add a variable, you impose that it's an nth root of the equation of the divisor, and then you let, you let the roots of unity act on this. So where, where this is non-zero, the action is free and you're not doing anything, you get this qu quotient stack is just X, where, where F doesn't vanish. But where F vanishes, you have non-trivial stabilizers and, and also ramific you can see that there's ramification. You get X to the end equals zero. So this is how you construct them explicitly in, in this case. If you have A2 with two boundary components, you can, uh, ext you're gonna extract nth roots of the two variables, or you can also do mixed things where you take nth roots of X and nth roots of Y, and then instead of mu n squared, you're gonna divide by mu n cross mu n. But for, for what I wanna do, this diagonal case is gonna be, it's gonna be enough. So here you have stabilizers, um, mu, you have a stabilizer mu n squared over the origin and uh, mu n over the axis outside of the origin and trivial outside. So the size of the stabilizers here reflects the rank of the logarithmic structure. And this procedure sort of embeds the logarithmic structure in, in the geometry of the object as uh, stacky data, as stabilizers, basically. So let me just briefly mention uh, the. in general, you can give a functorial description of, of this. That's how it's constructed. In, in this case, where you have a pair of a smooth variety and a smooth divisor, this stack parameterizes nth roots of this object, where you take the, the line bundle associated to the divisor and its tautological section that, that cuts out the divisor. Um, so you're parameterizing roots of this thing, nth roots, so pairs given by a line bundle, a global section, and a, a fixed, uh, an isomorphism of the nth tensor power with, with that pair on your test scheme T. And it might be kind of clear that this, if you take the etal, the small etal site or topos of this object, you're capturing some of the Kumar etal site of the logarithmic scheme because this, I, I told you that this is ramified over X with uh, ramification N along the, well, in simple cases. Uh, so that allows the ramification. And then you're taking a tal morphisms over this thing. So you're capturing the, the ramification dividing N part of, of X, of this uh, site or topos. So if you want to capture the whole thing, it might seem natural to pass to the limit in some sense. So this is the object that uh, me and Vistoli uh, studied a few years ago. It's called, we call the, the infinite root stack. So it's, um, this stacks form uh, an inverse system. Every time n divides m, you have a projection map from the nth root to the nth root. And you can take the, the inverse limit. 
you can take this as a, a lax limit, I guess, or two limit maybe in, in stacks. So as an actual, you know, ca category fiber in group points, or you could think about the pro object in, uh, in algebraic stacks. In fact, both of these points of view are useful and uh, I've, I've had to use both in, uh, in past work, so. So this, um, captures the, the Kummer et al, and we'll, we'll see that in a second. But uh, one thing that makes it a bit unpleasant to work with is that it's not an algebraic stack. It's not too far. So et al locally on X, it's, you can write it as a quotient stack of two schemes, of, of a scheme with a, by, a, by a group scheme. But the problem, so this is good. The bad thing is that neither of these is of finite type. So that's a bit yikes uh, but it's okay for for something so here's an example if you take the infinite root stack of uh, of this pair a1 comma zero you're adding every possible nth root of the parameter t of the variable here of a1 and you're modding out by the inverse limit of these uh, roots of unity and of course neither of these things is of finite type Still, it's it's a quotient stack. You can you can work with them to some extent. So the the the, the point of introducing this, apart to study the the Kummer-Tal topology, is uh, that this object encodes the logarithmic structure of X completely as stacky structure. So with with this study, we proved. Uh, that there is an inverse construction to this association. So you can recover the log scheme from the infinite root stack, which tells you that you can work on the stack doing usual algebraic geometry things uh, as if you're working on the logarithmic scheme. So you don't have to use uh, sheaves of monoids or, or this, uh, that you know, what, what I showed you till now. One, uh, this functor is not faithful, not, not fully faithful, but it, it, it reflects isomorphisms. So if two log schemes have isomorphic infinite root stacks, they're isomorphic themselves, but there are more morphisms of stacks than just morphisms of, of log schemes. So it's just that. And this is, this slide is just a, an aside from somewhat from everything else. So one way to think about this object is that it's, it's a completely algebraic version of something called the Kato Nakayama space of a logarithmic scheme over the complex numbers. So this Kato Nakayama space is a sort of analytification functor for logarithmic schemes, which uh, produces a topological space. And I'm not gonna go into details, but if you apply this construction to the pair A1 comma zero, it, it gives you this infinite cylinder, which is also the, the real oriented blow up of the complex plane at the origin. So you're replacing the origin with a copy of S1. And uh, otherwise, you, you, the, all the rest is left untouched. So this construction modifies the analytification of your scheme only along the, the boundary. The infinite root stack is, well, is, is again, A1 minus zero stays you know, is, is a one minus zero. And then at the origin, you have a, a stabilizer mu infinity, which is the inverse limit of all the mu n's. If you're over C, you can non-canonically, I guess, identify this mu infinity with Z hat. And uh, maybe uh, some people would like to see a Z hat of one here. That should be a tape twist, but I'm not, let's not worry about that. Um, so the, the, these two pictures are kind of similar, right? So S1 is BZ, and here you have BZ hat. There's a profinite completion happening when, when you go from, from this topological picture to the, the algebraic. And we, we actually, we formalized this uh, with, with David Karkedi, this, this C is Karkedi, uh, Sarah, Nicolo, and myself. Uh, we showed that there's always, uh, if you have a scheme locally finite type over the complex numbers, a log scheme, fine saturated. Then there's a comparison map from this topological realization to a sort of topological incarnation of the infinite root stack, which is uh, equivalent sub to profinite completion. 
this is of course the analog of the usual um, comparison between the etal homotopy type of a scheme, locally finite type over the complex numbers in good cases, and the uh, and the topological space underlying the analytification. So I just wanted to mention this to to you know give you uh, some more clear picture about this object, maybe. So now the the point. Uh, that ties to, to what I was talking about until now is that there are also equivalences of ring topoi between the Kummertal topos of, uh, of the log scheme and a sort of small etal topos of this stack uh, where you have to take, so by this small etal topos, I mean you take representable and etal maps to, to this guy. So remember, this is not algebraic, so there's no scheme that has an etal morphism to it, at least subjective. Uh, so you have to, I mean, these, the objects of this site are going to be stacked themselves. And, but anyway, there's this definition of a small, the small etal site and the topoi, there's an equivalence of topoi between the first, the resulting topos and the Kummer etal topos. And the same is true in the Kummer flat situation where you take a small FPPF site of the stack. These equivalences give you equivalences between the, categories of perfect complexes. So the punchline here is that you can use this stack to, to study um, the Kummer tal or Kummer flat geometry and topology of, of a logarithmic scheme. The one thing that point out is that since in, in good cases, this category will be the direct limit of the categories of perfect complexes in the fine on the finite root stacks, which are algebraic and are more amenable to, um, to work with, to be worked with. So now we come to these uh, non-commutative motives. And you'll notice here, I, I wrote Kummer flat additive invariance. In the title, I had Kummer et al, but then I decided to, to talk about Kummer flat because with et al, there's always this prime to P thing that gets in the way of it. So, um, as non-commutative motives, we, we use a notion that was developed by Bloomberg, Gepner, and Tabuada. Uh, I guess they were inspired by earlier work um, by Kuncevich and, and others, I guess. Um, so there's this category of uh, additive, maybe non-commutative motives, that is the universal recipient for what's called an additive invariant of uh, stable infinity categories. So uh, this U is a functor from the category of idempotent complete small stable infinity categories. And this is the universal recipient for such a functor that preserved filter co-limits and sends split exact sequences to split co-fiber sequences. So here, uh, split exact sequences here, uh, I mean, there's a, it's a, a diagram like this where the composite is zero. The, this map induces an isomorphism between the co-fiber of this and uh, and C, and there's adjoints also. This is a split, the split part. It's a question in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Then you can read it out loud, so we can have it on the recording. Thanks. Can we see an example of an tal cover of the infinity root stack of a fine line with the origin? I mean, I can cheat and tell you that you can take the disjoint union of two copies and and uh, map but that's not going to make you happy probably. Um, and that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything explicit right now. Sorry. Uh, but it can, can be from a scheme, right? That's... Uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. Right, so um, this is what I mean by additive invariant. And this thing of non-commutative motives, uh, the, the tie with, with, with schemes is that the non-commutative motive of a scheme or stack is uh, you apply this universal additive, additive invariant to the category of perfect infinity, stable infinity category of perfect complexes on your, on your scheme. 
So given this definition of non-commutative motive of a scheme, uh, you could we you could define the the Kummer flat or Kummer et al uh, non-commutative motive of a, a log scheme as uh, this U applied to the category of perfect complexes on the infinite root stack or on the Kummer flat topos. The idea here is that this object encodes the log geom the log structure completely as algebra geometric that data. So this uh, should make some sense. And the, what we prove is that the Hagiara is the old decomposition of the K-theory, of the algebraic K-theory that I showed you before, comes from semi-orthogonal decompositions on this category. So from this categorical level. This will also give a decomposition of the non-commutative motive itself. And as a, as a consequence, it gives you the same decomposition, the same splitting for all, every other additive invariant that, that you want to consider. So I'll mention a couple later. But. So where, where do these uh, semi-orthogonal decompositions come from? At the finite level, so if, if you take an, a finite n here, and uh, let's take the case of a, a stack with a, with a smooth, let's say, Cartier divisor, there's this theorem that was uh, proved first by Ishii and Weda, and then was generalized by Berg, Luntz, and Schnurer, that says the following. Uh, you can, the, the category of perfect complexes on, uh, on this root stack of a pair, where I say that D is, is smooth, has a semi-orthogonal decomposition as follows, with a bunch of copies of perf D, so perfect complexes on the boundary, uh, exactly n minus one copies. And then at the end, there's a copy of perfect complexes on the whole uh, X. So semi orthogonal decomposition, this means that these are all admissible subcategories of, of this, and uh, there's no maps that go backwards. So there's no maps from any object here to any object here and, and so on. And the, the way you should think about these pieces as being indexed by characters of the stabilizers that live along D on this stack. So the stabilizers are mu n. This piece corresponds to trivial stabilizers. And uh, in fact, you can take the whole space here because there's a trivial stabilizer elsewhere also. But these copies um, correspond to non-trivial characters. So with minus one, minus n plus one, uh, I've denoted a, a set of you know, representatives of the character in Z mod n. Oh, Angelo. Hi, Angelo. Thanks for the comment. Okay, maybe, maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, so this, this is embedded. Here's how these pieces are embedded inside here. This perfect is embedded just via the uh, pullback along, uh, along the projection. And then uh, the kth piece here, the minus kth piece, I guess, is uh, embedded like this. You, you pull back from D to the universal nth root on, um, on, on this stack, which is the reduction of the pre-image of D. Then you push forward to the stack from this closed substack and twist by this line bundle that carries the character minus k uh, of, the, of the stabilizer. So you could think of these pieces as, you should think of these pieces as being indexed by the characters of this group that's acting. Now, this semi-orthogonal decomposition gives you a decomposition of the, this non-commutative motive of, of this stack. And in turn, this gives you the same splitting for K-theory or, or any other of these additive invariants. And now the, the, the thing is to take a limit of, of these decompositions. Um, and then you can take further routes along other divisors and, and this semi-orthogonal decomposition gets more and more complicated. Now the bookkeeping gets messy and I, I wanna try to give you an idea of why, but this is not super important. So I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll skip over it. 
so the point is that these semi-orthogonal decompositions that I've just described are not compatible when you when you extend roots, say from from the second root you pass to the sixth root. Uh, you by by taking by using the semi-orthogonal decomposition given by the second root and seeing the sixth root stack as the third root of the second root and applying this procedure starting from this, you get something different than uh, what you would get if you just look at the sixth root stack and apply the, the construction that I just described. So it's a bit unpleasant. The reason is the following. I, here, if you start from the second root, you have two pieces. One corresponds to the trivial character, the other one corresponds to the non-trivial character of, of mu2. And then you, you take third roots. So this whole category goes here and is as the trivial character of mu3. And here you have perf over the universal, universal root in this stack, which has a decomposition itself. In, term of, of, in terms of perf of the de initial divisor, uh, indexed by characters of mu2 again. But now, if, if you use this splitting down here, you'll get a piece, C, C is the category perf D, you'll get a copy of C with the character mi minus three of mu6. And, and then here I've, uh, I've written down the other, the other characters that you, that you get by splitting up these, these guys. The trouble is that um, while you can swap around some of these categories harmlessly, because some of these are completely orthogonal, so there's, there's no problem, uh, passing this to, to the place where it should be here is, is a bit more complicated. And it might be that, that, that this just differ by a mutation. I don't know. You know th this is an, an interesting thing that uh, we should think about. But also, these two categories, the one that you get from this decomposition and the one that you get from this decomposition are actually different subcategories of, of this guy. This is kind of easy to see, but I'm not going to get into it. So there's some problem if you, these, these decompositions are, are not compatible on the nodes. You have to do something. So what we do is a kind of simple way out. Uh, we, instead of running through the whole inverse system, given by the natural numbers ordered by divisibility, we just take the factorials. And the factorials here give you a linearly ordered chain that, that just gives you the, the same limit. So um, by, by writing this as the direct limit, as the inverse limit of these objects along the factorials, you don't really have to worry about this, uh, this absence of comp Compatibility. You just have to re to order to place a weird ordering on Z mod six here. That's one way out. So the what we prove as a this is a, a you know summing up uh, is that if you have an algebraic stack with a Cartier divisor. There's, there's a couple of bullets here. So if, if D is simple normal crossings, we, uh, we produce a semi-orthogonal decomposition of the category of perfect complexes on this infinite root stack, which is a pre-ordered, this P stands for pre-ordered, um, and has, these are, uh, these are finitely many pieces. So the index, the index set here is the set of strata of the divisor. So there, there's a category, for, for each stratum of the, of the divisor. And each one of those categories has a further semi-orthogonal decomposition with pieces that are all equal to the isomorphic to the category of perfect complexes on the stratum. And they're indexed by uh, this set that we also had in the, in the Hagiar and Isio decomposition uh, with the caveat that there's a weird ordering on this, on this set. So, uh, for the semi-orthogonality, you're asking that there are no maps in certain directions, and due to the non-compatibility that I just tried to describe, we have to place uh, to put a weird ordering on this. Um, this is with D, S, and C. Uh, I want to point out that this is we proved this for an algebraic stack. X could be singular, uh, where outside of D. D needs to be simple normal crossings, so X has to be smooth along D, but it could be singular elsewhere. 
and in the theorem of Aguiar and Isiol, these things, uh, they, they've had a smooth scheme, a regular. They have a version over, not over a field where you take a regular scheme and, and, and all that. Uh, honestly, I don't know if their proof can be adapted to the non-smooth setting, maybe, but this is a, an advantage, you know, this machinery over, that it just gives you uh, a more general statement like this. And we also have uh, versions for when the divisor is not simple normal crossings, but only normal crossings. In that case, here uh, you get the normalizations of the strata as, uh, as pieces. And, uh, and we also have a version where you have simplicial. So this is a toroidal pair, basically, with simplicial singularities. So the, the fans of the toric varieties describing this as a toroid embedding are, are something called simplicial. So some, we have some more general statement. It follows that you have a decomposition for the non-commutative motive, just uh, the same as Aguiar and, and Nisios. And um, since this holds for the universal additive invariant, it holds for every additive invariant, including K theory, but there's others like Hochschild, cyclic homology, and um, so forth. And then you can, I mean, in our paper, we defined a, a Kummertal, say, churn character map just by applying some general formalism at the level of, uh, of these non commutative motives. And you can write down a Riemann rock formula, which is just stratum by stratum here. So um, it's one version of, of this story. Maybe there, there's something, there's some other um, versions of these things that could be defined for, for log schemes. And, uh, but this certainly you can do. And let me finish with a couple of questions that I think might be interesting. So, one is if, if there's any relationship with these uh, objects that I just described with other definitions that I know uh, exist of Hochschild homology, for example, Olson, I think, has some work on, on this, and cyclic homology. There's also, there's also work on the topological Hochschild homology and topological cyclic homology that I know very little about uh, by Rockness and, and others. And yeah, so what do these things talk to each other and the other one which is more maybe more uh, relevant to the title of the seminar here is the relationship with other notions of motives for log schemes so i know of a couple there's uh, one by howell and pologotsky and another one by binda polarne and park that i know has been talked about in this seminar before so yeah this could be something interesting to to think about in the future and that is all I have. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, Mattia, for a wonderful talk. We can all unmute and give uh, Mattia a round of applause. Thank you. So we usually end with a round of questions, and maybe I can start. So. Um, going back to, to log schemes, I guess it, it's sort of unclear. To, there's no notion of a perfect complex, let alone a coherent sheaf for, for log schemes, I guess. But somehow you circumvent this by passing to the infinite root stack. Yeah. 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 Do you want me to comment on this? I mean, was yeah, this... Okay. Ah, okay. Yes, so uh, that's right. So the, the notion that we, we use of, uh, well, I'm going back, but I don't know if I have anything to show you. Um, the notion that this notion of coherent sheaf or perfect complex is, uh, is one possible notion. And the sheaves on this infinite root stack, at least in good cases, are exactly sheaves on this Kummer et al or Kummer flat site that was used before. But um, they also correspond to something called parabolic sheaves that I haven't mentioned at all, but there are also other objects that were uh, introduced and studied, but they're the same, they're the same thing. Um, but yeah, there, there could and should maybe be some other notion of a coherent sheaf on a logarithmic scheme. And then uh, that's, uh, that's something that I've been chasing for a while, but not, you know, 
not, not with uh, uh, resounding success, let's say. And uh, I, I, I'm not aware of any definitive notion, let's say. That, that's certainly an interesting point also. Thanks. So please go ahead, guys, and ask Matia any questions you may have. Okay, don't be shy. Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. That's fine. Um, okay, last chance for a question. Okay, then everything seems clear. Okay, thanks a lot again, Matteo. I was really, really pleased to hear this talk. So thanks again. Thank you.